team here at Google. Uh, before I came to Google, my background was at NASA, and so I have a special place in my heart for uh, the government-run remote sensing uh, and science efforts uh, that are extremely well represented by two speakers who I'm very honored to have the opportunity to introduce today. Uh, so they'll each uh, be telling us a few words in their respective domains for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to have a Q&A up on stage where I'll have a few questions for them, and I'll also moderate any questions that you may have uh, from the audience. Uh, so with that logistics out of the way and without further ado, uh, the first speaker who I'm uh, excited to be introducing to you is Peter Doucette. Uh, he is, what is his formal title? Let me get this right. Uh, he is the Associate Coordinator uh, of the National Land Imaging Program uh, at the uh, USGS National Center uh, in Reston, Virginia. Uh, so uh, they uh, run a lot of the ground segment for the Landsat program. As I'm sure you're all very well aware, uh, Landsat has been an absolute cornerstone data set in the Earth Engine data catalog. Uh, and we're very excited to have uh, Peter tell us a little bit about where that program is headed. Uh, Peter has a PhD in spatial information engineering uh, from UMaine. He's been uh, in the spatial imaging space uh, since the early 90s. Uh, working in government and private sector and academia. Uh, and uh, a lot of his interests now revolve around uh, how to take the constellation of uh, remote sensing tools that are coming online, ranging from, say, Landsat to small sats, uh, and bring that together into uh, an integrated uh, framework that we can use to really understand our changing planet. Uh, so his interests align very much with our own. And I'm very excited to give you Peter Doucette. Yeah. Uh, Okay, thank you very much, Matt. And I'd like to thank uh, Rebecca and Tyler for putting this event together and for inviting me. I'm very priv privileged to be hanging out with the cool people. Um, so let's uh, move on here. So uh, Sustainable Land Imaging Program is the new kind of label, if you will, of the, uh, the umbrella that now the Landsat program will fall under. And so what sustainable land imaging basically implies is a commitment long term, which gets us away from the one-off mentality that much of the Landsat you know, program has, has seen. So it's about development of a multi-decadal so strategy involved. Yes, the government can think strategy long term. And so how these roles and responsibilities are divided. So NASA is responsible for the space, the space systems, right? They build the instrumentation or they contract it out to be built, and they, and they launch. They, they're very good at launching um, and, and building instrumentation. Of course, NASA you know, spans the gamut of the analysis side as well. But those are their, that, those, you know, that's their forte. And uh, USGS, through the Department of Interior, is responsible for the ground systems, as Matt was saying. So that means that once uh, NASA builds, launches, and puts onto orbit, checks it out in orbit, a Landsat satellite they, that you know, in a way, kind of hand over the keys to USGS and say, okay, now it's yours. You fly it, responsible for all the downlinking of the data, the processing, the archiving, dissemination, all of that good stuff. Okay, so what is unique about Landsat, of course, as we all know, is the archive, right? Going back to uh, 1972, it's considered a gold standard within the community. Uh, there you can see Landsat 5 went for, uh, operated for nearly 29 years. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, so Landsat 7 and 8 continuing to operate with a few issues that we're all familiar with. Now Landsat 7 will be running out of fuel, out of maneuvering fuel, in roughly the 2020 to 2021 time frame, uh, which is just in time to have Landsat 9, which is currently in development, to replace it. And Landsat 9 represents the first mission under this SLI, or Sustained Land, land Imaging uh, rubric, if you will. And uh, Landsat 10, which is in the uh, kind of preliminary design stages. So 2018 marks the start of what NASA calls these architecture study teams, where it's a team uh, put together of very, various backgrounds with uh, understanding of the space side and the data side and the ground system side to determine uh, what's possible going forward. And so that, that process will launch in summer of this year, looking towards a mid-2020s launch for Landsat 10. So, where Landsat 9 will be a copy, essentially, of Landsat 8 with a few uh, upgrades, but it's essentially a copy of 8, okay? Landsat 10, on the other hand, uh, at this point, everything's on the table. A lot of people suspect that it'll be a, a big departure from what Landsat 9 and 8 look like. You know, I mean, you know, spectrometer could be a constellation of, of small sats. So everything's still being discussed. Everything's still on the table. It's a pretty exciting time to be talking about that. So here we see 
an orbit for Landsat uh, 8, 185 kilometers swath width, uh, at that 98.2 degree uh, angle of inclination there. And you can see how Landsat 8 uh, does its global coverage over its 16 day cycle, okay? Of course, Landsat 7 is in an opposite orbit from 8, right? Circling the planet. And so Landsat 8, every 16 days, a total revisit of the planet or, or refresh of the planet. Doesn't mean, it doesn't guarantee uh, uh, pixels that are cloud free. It's just, you know, refresh of the planet. So with Landsat 7 combined with 8, it's an eight day revisit. Now, if you throw Sentinel 2 into the mix with those two Sentinels A and B, because Sentinel is, Sentinel 2 is Landsat line, uh, like by design, we can get down to two to four day revisit. So, you know, we're looking at harmonization studies and that's pretty exciting. Um, free and open data policy, Rebecca talked about this. Back in 2008, you can see the download rate, you know, really ramping up here, which was coming from uh, a region of about 20,000 scenes per year, and now, you know, it's really going up. So, created a market that didn't exist prior to 2008. Um, and by the way, I did purchase a couple scenes back in 2006, and so the government owes me 1,200 bucks. <laughs> I uh, don't think I'll see that, but uh, we did a, uh, a, an interesting survey in 2012 that demonstrated a significant annual uh, value from, from Landsat data, which well exceeds the development and operational costs. And of course, in more uh, recent years, you know, the, the cloud community, you know, i.e. Google and others have been uh, going to town with rehosting the data. And of course, I, mean, I don't have to talk about that to this community. So uh, very exciting times here. Now this, what's interesting is this, this uh, curve here, which represents downloaded scenes from Earth Explorer does not take into account, you know, what the cloud vendors are either uh, distributing or people are banging on in the cloud. So the numbers far exceed those, you know, we have no doubt, we don't know what they are beyond what we track. Uh, this is the Aero Center that somebody talked about this morning, the Earth Resources Observation and Science Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, out in the middle of corn country there. So this is the, the on-prem, if you will, for the processing that goes on for Landsat. Uh, it was the first ground station in 72, you can see the numbers there. Uh, manages about 40 petabytes, um, and you can see that, you know, less than half of that is Landsat. So this, they, they do more than just Landsat. Last 12 months distributed 37 petabytes, and about 20 of that was Landsat. Uh, so speaking of some of the other data sets, so what those two blue categories represent are the Landsat data sets, and then green show, you know, some LP DAC, Sentinel-2, uh, ISRO data, other sets, and then some, some non-satellite stuff. Some of this stuff goes way back historically you know, into the 1930s airborne data. So, so there's really quite a bit, uh, treasure trove of, of data there at Eros. So what have we done for you lately, on top of everything I just talked about? Uh, it's tried to provide you some relief from this 80-20 rule, right? That is well known in the data science world that uh, people are spending much more time doing data prep than being a scientist or a researcher or an engineer. So, and here's some of, the, some of these 80% uh, activities, if you will, you know, this is just a small list of things out there, but all kinds of, of data prep, you know, taking care of sampling biases and all these kinds of things. So what exists today, and we just launched, USGS did in November, officially, November of last year, was analysis-ready data. Okay, and so we'll go into what some of that is, and even though I think this community, or a lot of you are probably familiar with it, um, so here, here's one way that we make the da data more analysis ready. So on the left there, you see your top, top of atmosphere reflectance level one data, and then the surface reflectance level two. So we've, we've accounted for the atmosphere here. Uh, this is the DC area, and maybe even some hot air over the, the center part, which is DC. We got rid of some of that probably. Um, and uh, QA band information, and that's gonna contain stuff like cloud, cloud shadow, ice snow, these kinds of things. Here you're seeing some of the clouds that have been identified in the QA band. And uh, some of you may be aware of this natural orbital shifting that goes on with, with Landsat passes. It's perfectly natural. It's a natural part of the orbit. But it does cause some shifts, you know, east and west here that for people stacking up data, you know, I, I can see where it's a bit unsettling perhaps. Even though it's all geo-referenced, there's nothing inaccurate about it, but it's not, you know, perfectly lined up. And so, Another aspect of ana analysis ready data is this new tiling system, okay, which is an Albers equal area projection. You can see that here, and this is a fixed grid. 
So the way this is working is, you know, as Landsat passes with its orbits, it's filling in these grid tiles or these uh, ARD tiles, which are 5,000 by 5,000 5, pixels. You can see how that works. And then over time, the user can go in and download a stack that's stacked in time and is consistently located in this tiling system. So facilitating time series analysis much more than, you know, you had to do this manually in the past. And so here's some of that, that analysis ready nature of it. So the tiling, the atmosphere correction are the two biggies. And here you see uh, using the, the quality assurance band to you know, get rid of the null data and, and the clouds, again, to facilitate the process of filtering these things out, right? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about time series. And we'll start with my $1,200 pair of images. Uh, so looking at one particular pixel here, and we plot uh, the, re the surface reflectance as a function of time. And here's what we have, these two points. So pretty limited in what you can do with this from you know, traditional change detection when you had to pay for the data. You know, maybe you've got the pair. You determine you know, what the difference is in reflectance. And you, uh, if that's above some threshold, you flag it as change, right? But with analysis-ready data and the free and open archive, we now can get all of the observations, in this case back to 84, and uh, do some fancy mathematics and fit trend models, as you'll see here, the sinusoidal fit uh, in a piecewise manner. And here, you know, you're capturing the seasonal or the, the, the phenology, so that change. And then the break is capturing when you've got a change in class type, at least this algorithm uh, has the ability to do that. So we're associating this spectro-temporal information, if you will, the coefficients of that fit function associating that with a particular class type. So that, that's pretty innovative. And this is an algorithm known as continuous change detection cla and classification. And, and what's continuous about it is obvious. These are continuous piecewise functions. It was developed by Boston University. Here's the citation at the bottom, Jeju and, and Professor uh, Curtis Woodcock, who's with us, of course. So let's kind of look at another application of the CCDC, visualizing a pixel in time. For land use change, here we see uh, scenes that are captured somewhere within this spectral temporal trajectory. Of these four piecewise fits showing you know, cropland going to hay, in conversion, and finally developed. And again, associated with a particular class type. Okay, so to me, this is kind of the data science-y part of what's going on here. So I put visualization in quotes in that it's not just visualizing a time lapse of of uh, pixel intensities. It's visualizing what's going on in this space, which is what data scientists get excited about. So to kind of see this information in a, in a more regional uh, setting, here you see mapping the timing of land changes with a test site in the Pacific Northwest. Zooming in here, now we can see how things are changing in time. The red colors are more recent, and the blue colors are things that haven't been changing uh, very recently, obviously. So all of this that I've talked about, ARD and CCDC, kind of culminates with this LC map initiative that USGS is now pursuing, which is this land change monitoring assessment and projection. So in a nutshell, it's all it's 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 the how, why, and where are things changing, right? And of course, kind of added this to that. Uh, everybody wants to know the future. So can we get enough information about understanding why things are changing so we can build models that do explain it? puts us in a better position for being able to project or predict how land change uh, will be occurring. So here we see uh, to the right, uh, this is again LC map, an example of some LC map. Uh, th this video didn't start, it should have started automatically. Let me see if I can, okay, well, this is an annual uh, cycling video that will show you the change going on here in this region. Uh, the uh, Expansion of urban and agri agricultural regions is pretty. So, so this is a level three product, right? So this, this is categorized pixels. And now we can, we can generate one of these map type products anywhere within the Landsat record. Okay, and again, the big thing, the big takeaway is understanding and explaining that historical change to put us in a better position for being able to model future change. Okay, and by the way, uh, right up here, just north of the urban areas where I used to work, Pacific Northwest National Lab, that's where I was when I paid the $1,200. Okay, so sensor harmonization. 
Um, so here we see the Landsat spectral band passes that we're all familiar with, okay, in the, in the, uh, the EM spectrum on the bottom there. And here are the Landsat 7 uh, band passes, fairly similar. And now let's compare that to the uh, Sentinel-2, okay? So again, Sentinel-2 by design was Landsat-like, and you can see that that's clearly the case. It's not exactly, you know, the same as Landsat-8, but, but fairly similar. With obvious differences in red edge, so Sentinel-2 obviously doing much more to capture that information, which is very uh, useful for the VEG community, and uh, no thermal bands on the other end. So some interesting differences, but uh, we are pursuing harmonization studies to look at that. And here you can see the orbitology. You can see the swath width of Sentinel-2 is a 290 K versus 185, so a much bigger swath, right, which gets you the, the uh, more frequent revisit of 10 days versus 16. Now we have our, asked our uh, Landsat science team to consider how they might leverage SmallSat data, which is, which is really proliferating, as we all know. Uh, the SmallSat uh, community is, is kind of focusing on the viz and near parts of the spectrum right now because you know, that's what their customers want at the moment. And they're at these GSDs of you know, one to five meters roughly. So of course, SmallSat data doesn't have anywhere near the, the calibration integrity as, as these, these other government systems, but, not, but they do have a much uh, more frequent revisit, so is there some kind of way to complement that? And that's what we're, we're asking our Landsat science team to look into. Here you see an example. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Jeff Massick at NASA, who's kind of leading the, the study on the NASA side, the harmonization between Landsat and Sentinel-2. Um, in the graph there, you can see uh, uh, that's NDVI versus day of year. Uh, the red uh, fit is showing the, uh, the response for alfalfa. The Sentinel-2 observations are the diamond shapes and the Landsat-8 are the plus shapes. So what it gets you is obviously more observations, right, through which to, to fit these functions. And so in this case, these inverted spikes are kind of capturing these mowing events of alfalfa. So here, here's a simple uh, harmonization type product that, you know, we're looking at. But you know, I think there's, there's tons of opportunity here for harmonization. So everything we've talked about, LCMAP and ARD, et cetera, uh, gets us to a great point for this uh, land cover and land use layer, if you will, which is um, you know, space and time like we talked about. But from my perspective, that's just the beginning. Okay? There's, there's much more stuff that can be added or integrated into this story. And I'm just, you know, these are, these are exemplar layers. I mean, throw in a layer of your, of your favorite flavor and add it, you know, even socio, culture, and economics. Uh, and assimilating this kind of, uh, these different layers of information to get to this holy grail of integrated predictive capabilities. That's what everybody wants. That, that's the data science, you know, big ticket item is, is the predicted uh, response of a particular, uh, you know, uh, model of interest. And so this is uh, non-trivial to say the least. It's a heavy lift. We're talking about some some pretty heavy-duty things that need to go on to realize this kind of assimilation. You know, data cube architecture standards, the big data, machine learning, AI. This is a biggie, uncertainty, quantification, and propagation, right? A lot of people talk about that. I heard somebody this morning say they were, so I was, I was pleased to hear that. But how uncertain, because you're going to have a variety of uncertainties across these heterogeneous data types, and how that, um, that, that propagates in an integrated manner is really going to affect the final product. So, something that we need to spend more time considering. Uh, and that's essentially it. I'm, here I'm just summarizing everything I just talked about. So Landsat 9 is on target for 2020 launch. Landsat 10 architecture study starts this year. Uh, analysis ready date, I didn't point out that what, what became available in November was for the US only, right? There is no global ARD today, at least not being offered by USGS. So uh, we do have that challenge before us. It's going to require, I believe, and as do others, leveraging commercial cloud because on-prem is going to be very challenging to, to do that. So uh, that gets us to kind of the bottom bullets here about needing to engage with the private sector through these public-private partnering. It's kind of why I'm here in part. Uh, we've been talking with Google and, and other people about you know, possibilities on where we might go with that from processing perspective, storage, and distribution. Uh, and, uh, you know, more to come. So thank you very much for your attention. That's all I have.
Peter. Uh, thank you, Peter. So um, if any of you have questions for Peter, that's awesome. Uh, hold on to them for a bit. We'll have a chance to take questions uh, for both our speakers during the Q&A following the talks. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have our second talk. Uh, and so uh, I'm next uh, very excited to introduce uh, Pierre Poutin, uh, who is the Sentinel-1 mission manager. So Sentinel-1, uh, for those of you who may not be aware, uh, this is, uh, from my perspective, like my dream satellite radar mission. Uh, this is uh, a, uh, a synthetic aperture radar mission that has both a systematic acquisition strategy and an open data policy, and that's just been transforming the world of radar-based global mapping in recent years as people begin to figure out what to do with this kind of data. Uh, Peter, uh, or, or Pierre, has the challenge of coordinating with the many stakeholders in the space, uh, ranging from the Copernicus program to end user communities to European nation states uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, so uh, he has a, a deep background, uh, uh, originally a uh, degree in engineering uh, and uh, space systems, uh, but uh, he actually came to uh, ESA's Center for Earth Observation uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, and uh, he worked on the, um, what am I looking for here, the Envisat, there we go, the Envisat mission, uh, which is, of course, a, a famous remote sensing mission that kicked off a lot of what we're doing today. Uh, and then he was involved in establishing the Copernicus program, its program policies, uh, and now uh, is, uh, has this operational leadership role within the Sentinel-1 mission. Uh, so uh, here to tell us a bit more about the Sentinel programs, uh, Pierre Poutin. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, uh, for the nice words regarding the Sentinel mission and regarding the Sentinel in general. So it's a pleasure for me to be uh, uh, with you today. Um, and I would like to warmly thank the Google uh, colleagues for inviting ISA for this uh, uh, user summit. So I'll try to provide an overview of the, um, uh, where we stand today with the Copernicus program and with the Sentinel's uh, missions in general. Where are we coming from? We are coming uh, with the space business for, uh, from the space uh, 1.0 related to mainly astronomy. Today, uh, after the space 2.0, space race, uh, then the, the international cooperation, the 3.0, we are definitely in the space uh, 4.0, which is space for uh, society. And definitely, the Earth observation, uh, remote sensing in general, is uh, definitely in, in part of this uh, space for society. And what you are doing all with uh, uh, Google Earth Engine in the, is a, par a perfect illustration of uh, what's going on with, uh, with this uh, space uh, 4.0. Couple of messages regarding the number of satellites, Earth observation satellites, which have been uh, recently launched. Uh, over the past 12 years, there were about uh, 220 satellites, uh, Earth observation satellites, more than 50 kilos, uh, excluding uh, meteor satellites. And in the coming five years, this figure will be increased to uh, about 560 uh, new satellites, and this definitely marks a change in Earth observation. So there is definitely the need to, uh, to manage uh, all this data, uh, which are coming from these various uh, Earth observation missions. So Earth observation to support global policies. Uh, yes, uh, this is what you are doing as well. I mean, uh, we, we tried with an uh, association that uh, at ESA to support uh, different actions. You see, uh, for example, here the climate-related actions, uh, uh, implementation of, of the Paris uh, Agreement, sustainable development, uh, the UN uh, sustainable uh, uh, development goals, and also uh, disaster risk reductions, uh, Sendai framework, for instance. So there is a huge potential for uh, uh, remote sensing data to support this type of um, uh, actions or uh, objectives. I would like to show you this uh, small animation, which is related to the, the new Sentinel uh, missions, which is a Sentinel-5 precursor, which is uh, dealing with um, atmospheric composition monitoring. And uh, you can uh, monitor quite precisely with a very good resolution in the order of five to seven kilometers. Um, the pollution uh, of uh, trace uh, gases, in this case, is uh, uh, nitrogen uh, dioxide. And this is what you can see in one day only. So it's quite impressive in terms of uh, capability. And you see in the, uh, around New York City here what uh, the, the spread of this uh, pollutant, uh, which is quite large. Um, so this is the next mission to, to come. The data are not yet available. Uh, the satellite, the mission is still under commissioning phase. 
but around the summer or just after summer, data will start to be available, and I hope that uh, Google will uh, uh, integrate that in the in the search engine. At ISA, we try to um, let's say uh, support innovation. So uh, we have open, uh, we have launched an initiative which is called the Philab. And is this open ISA to a disruptive innovation in the association? And we address uh, different uh, uh, objectives uh, which are uh, exploring, so non EO technologies, artificial intelligence, future architecture of missions, inspiring as well, uh, connecting various sectors, uh, startups, innovators, ecosystems, and also invest in some uh, public private partnership. And this type of activity is also made in, uh, in cooperation with uh, Google Partners, uh, which is now starting uh, uh, as part of this uh, activity. And um, we are very pleased to cooperate with, uh, with Google on various uh, uh, actions. Uh, an overview of the Copernicus program, which is, as you know, the, the European Earth Observation Program, um, which is a, a program led by the European Union and implemented by the European Commission together with ESA, which is the, the space architect. Uh, ESA is developing the Sentinel satellite, is operating some of the missions uh, together with UMEDSAT. And uh, the overall objective of this program is to manage the environment, mitigate effect of climate change, and also ensure uh, civil security. And there are uh, one very important aspect, as you know, is we offer full, free, open access to Sentinel data. And this is really a change uh, uh, with the Earth observation missions, we in the continuity of uh, what uh, Landsat have been uh, offering in the past years. You see the number of uh, six services, main Copernicus services, which are managed by our partners from the European Commission here, which are covering the main uh, thematic uh, domains. So Copernicus is supposed to, uh, to tackle the, the new uh, societal challenges uh, related to climate change, uh, food, uh, water, with this increase of population on the Earth, uh, we, we need uh, somehow to, uh, uh, let's say, to, to tackle all these uh, new challenges uh, that we have to face um, uh, in this uh, century. So, uh, an overview of this uh, Sentinel satellite, and I think I'll go directly to the next uh, uh, slide that uh, summarizes the main missions that we have. So, Sentinel-1, star imaging mission, uh, so we can image through the clouds during night. Sentinel-2, we got already a nice presentation from, uh, from Peter. Uh, Sentinel-3, uh, ocean and global land monitoring. Uh, then we have two missions, uh, main missions related to atmospheric uh, composition monitoring, including the Sentinel-5 precursor here. This Sentinel-4 and 5 will fly on meteorological satellites uh, to be launched. And Sentinel-6, it's... Um, it's an altimetry related uh, mission. So in terms of uh, launch status, we have already seven satellites in orbit um, and uh, more to come, of course. And what is very interesting, as you can see at the bottom, is that we have also the C and D unit. If I take Sentinel-1, so we have the constellation which is ready with two satellites. The constellation is running operationally, but we have already the C and D uh, units for the replenishment of the constellation which are currently under procurement. And it's the same for Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3. We have also, as part of the Copernicus uh, initiative, some so-called contributing missions. Some of them are um, uh, very high-resolution missions. And uh, so we, there is a, a data buy concept to feed, actually, the, some uh, Copernicus services that need uh, higher resolution. And ISA is uh, doing, on behalf of the European Commission, this uh, data buy and distribution to the Copernicus services. Status overview of the Sentinel-1, 2, and 3 missions. I think I'll go quite fast on the, this technical information, and I will focus on uh, the elements that could be of interest for, for you in using uh, already uh, as part of uh, the Earth Engine, the, the Sentinel-1, uh, Sentinel-1, 2, and 3 uh, product. So uh, just to mention that, uh, yes, the repeat cycle of Sentinel-1 is 12 days with one satellite, six days for the constellation. We also use the so-called uh, European Data Relay Satellite System to relay the data from the satellites through the geo-orbits with optical links. Um, and this allows to have uh, more observations, to have a better timeliness of the, of the data. 
this EDRS system is also used for, uh, for Sentinel-2. And this is an overview of the, the SAR mode of operations with the characteristic of the level one GRD products. So the main mode of operations of Sentinel-1 is this so-called IW, the interferometry wide swath mode, 250 kilometers swath. Uh, it's, um, it's used over land and coastal waters. And uh, we use also the extra wide swath mode of a 400 kilometers swath for maritime surveillance, sea ice, ice dive monitoring, in particular by the Copernicus Marine Service. And we use also the wave modes by default over open oceans when other modes are not used. The street map has a higher resolution, but a smaller swath. And I'll come back on, on that. Um, so overall mission status, everything is nominal. We are in full operations. We have a stable acquisition plan. We systematically uh, produce level zero, one, and two products, and are made available. And uh, you see the, the trend of uh, pro daily productions. We have reached, uh, since about one year, this, uh, this steady state of 12 terabytes of product uh, per day, which is uh, quite substantial. Um, somewhere on the observation scenario of Sentinel-1, you see here the main thematic domains and the component that build this observation plan. And um, so I will not list all of them, uh, but it's really um, the beauty of a SAR mission is that it tackles quite some uh, different uh, thematic application domains, as you can see here. And uh, I will shortly present these two uh, maps, world map, that describe at high level the observation scenario of Sentinel-1. First, talking about the mode polarization and observation geometry, ascending or descending. You see that at global level, uh, we use the IW modes uh, over uh, land areas and coastal waters. On the polar areas, um, we use uh, the extra wide source mode for sea ice and ice dive monitoring. And uh, there are a number of small triangles. This is where we use the street map modes, smaller source but higher resolution. This is to uh, image some uh, small volcanic uh, islands. We don't show here the wave mode, which is operated over the open oceans. And in terms of revisit coverage frequency, what is very, uh, let's say it was quite a challenge, but uh, we made it. We, we managed to map the, the whole world, the land areas, at global level uh, every 12 days in dual polarization. And in some of the areas, uh, the tectonic mask, we also image in both ascending and descending. You can see also here that the focus is also in Europe, where we ensure ascending, descending at six days with the two satellites. And there is a high revisiting frequency for the Copernicus services dealing with sea ice on the polar regions, up to daily revisit. So uh, this allows uh, development of uh, Sentinel-1 applications in many thematic domains. I will not uh, go through all of them, but the potential is really here. And we have this strong user uptake. And I really hope that you are part of this uh, of this to use uptake in, uh, let's say, using a more and more Sentinel-1 uh, uh, imagery. And this is an example of uh, monitoring ice sheets in an operational manner with Sentinel-1 uh, data. And you see this uh, Greenland ice sheets uh, where the, you, this is a, a map of the glacier accelerations. And some of the glaciers are just monsters. And they go at a speed of, uh, in the order, up to 30, 40 meters per day. And this cre definitely creates uh, the, the sea level rise. Also, uh, Sentinel-1 is uh, an interferometric mission. So um, there is a huge potential. Actually, the user community uh, of Sentinel-1 dealing with interferometry is very large. And this is an example of uh, uh, the interferogram of the recent uh, earthquake and eruption of the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii. Let's go to Sentinel-2. Uh, this is uh, the optical mission for monitoring land and coastal regions. It's also a constellation of two satellites um, and a large swath, as mentioned by, by Peter, of uh, 290 kilometers. So you see also the, 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 the plan for the next uh, uh, CND unit here, and we'll have the, the second generation at the horizon 2030 as well. So, um, so Systematic acquisition of all land surfaces and coastal waters, high revisit frequency, five days with the two satellites, um, and high spatial resolution, 10 meters, 20 meters, 60 meters, 
large number of spectral bands, and I would like to warmly thank Peter, <laughs> who have already commented and uh, explained this uh, slide where we you see the comparison of the spectral bands. I just would like to, to add that uh, one of the challenge of the design of Sentinel-2 was to ensure a 10 meter resolution on some of the uh, visible bands uh, over a swath of 290 kilometers. So in terms of overall mission status, uh, we, uh, since 17 February uh, uh, this year, we now perform uh, the five-day revisit with the two satellite uh, constellation. So this is basically uh, a, a revisiting grid of uh, five days uh, with uh, 10 days around uh, Antarctica in some uh, areas uh, which are uh, some users are interesting to use also Sentinel-2 for maritime surveillance. And uh, we have been working also on generation, of course, of the level two uh, product. And for the time being, this is the, the geograph geographical area that we cover with Sentinel-2 uh, 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 level two product. And this is going to be generalized to the, um, to the world uh, after the, during the summer. And you see here the difference between the uh, 1C uh, and uh, and the 2A, uh, where we actually uh, correct the, uh, the atmosphere on the level 2A product. Um, and this was actually also presented, similar image by, uh, by Peter. So the next step for the Sentinel-2 mission is to start the global level 2A operational production in July. Um, then uh, we'll start also the, the geometry refined production using the GRI, global reference image, that allows to have uh, um, better regist registration of pixels for time series. And we we'll also uh, use an improved uh, DEM for level 1C and level 2A uh, productions. And also for Sentinel-2, uh, the range of applications is really increasing uh, thanks to this uh, time series in particular. As you can see here, various examples in various domains. Some of them are uh, quite uh, new like water quality, uh, surveillance of, um, uh, of uh, corals, for instance, uh, coastal zone, bathymetry, and, and so on. And to conclude with Sentinel-3, uh, which is the Ocean Global Land Mission, there are several instruments on board. There are three main instrument sets. Uh, on Google Earth engine, you use the OLCI a product of full resolution at 300 meter. Um, so you get uh, with this medium resolution mission much larger swaths. Uh, with OLCI, it's uh, more than 1,200 kilometers. Um, then uh, there is um, the SLSTR uh, instrument, which is CN lens surface temperature radiometer, and uh, um, a payload, a group of, of payload, which is topography uh, mission mainly uh, altimetry and the associated um, instruments. So in terms of revisit time, it's quite uh, impressive what we achieve with Sentinel-3 and uh, with the Ocean Color Sunglint-3, uh, we achieve about um, uh, two days uh, at the equator. And for land uh, color, uh, we have a, a day, roughly a daily revisit with two satellites. So very short uh, revisit for optical mi missions. And this is the uh, level uh, two ocean color uh, product of OLCI, which is operational since uh, July 2017. Then we get uh, from uh, SLSTR the sea surface temperature uh, since uh, the same date, actually, which is operationally uh, provided in level two product. And this is for the uh, altimetry uh, uh, payload, which is certainly less of interest in your, uh, in your activities. So in terms, this summarizes actually the, the status of the data availability of uh, Sentinel-3 uh, product. And uh, I would like to actually to focus on the fact that we are developing a level two synergy product, which will be a um, co-registration of uh, uh, imagery from both OLCI and SLSTR. And there are also additional products, aerosol optical depth and fire adaptive power, which are going to be uh, uh, offered uh, by the end of the year. And the second satellite of Sentinel-3, the 3B, was recently launched. Uh, we are currently in the commissioning phase, 
and uh, we plan to have the full operations capacity of the constellation of the two satellites so early uh, next year. And also in the case of Sentinel-3, we have quite uh, an increase of uh, applications in various domains, as you can see here, from agriculture to uh, fire monitoring, climate research, snow and ice, uh, and so on. So um, there is a huge potential with this mission as well. And I will conclude this, uh, this talk with a few words on the current uh, data access uh, at ESA. Uh, we have been setting up uh, three, uh, four main uh, data hubs. And the first one is the Copernicus Open Access Hub, to which actually uh, Google is connected to download uh, all relevant products, which are made available as part of the Earth engine. And uh, we have um, on this data hub uh, about 150,000 users who have registered. Then there are other hubs, collaborative hub to, uh, to support our member states with a privileged access, um, member states who have an agreement with ESA, international hubs, also to, uh, to support international partners for accessing uh, in a privileged ways on uh, Sentinel uh, data, and a specific hub for Copernicus services. And this user uptake is quite impressive with the Sentinel uh, data, as you can see here. And we see that uh, this is from the open access hub, uh, and we see that about 50% of active users are located in Europe. It would be interesting to cross-check with uh, what is the situation with the use of uh, uh, Google Earth Engine. Um, and these are more details regarding these active users uh, where you see the figures from the various uh, continents. We have recently published the so-called uh, data access annual report of last year. There is quite some interesting information. You see the, the user uptake, the way data are used. This is based on the open data access um, uh, operations. And to, to conclude, I will mention a few words regarding the evolution of uh, the Copernicus program and the Sentinels. We have the current Sentinels I have presented, but we are also working on the Sentinel expansion, so new mission in parallel we are working also on the Copernicus for security, and we will have the Sentinel next generation. So the key message that the Copernicus is really planned on the long term. Uh, it's, um, it, it's a program on which you can really base your, your activities because you are guaranteed that you will get the, the data really on the long term. And these are the six candidate missions um, with the next slides, which are the potential new Sentinels. They are not decided yet. Uh, one pr high priority one is the CO2 uh, uh, monitoring mission, and then you see polar ice and snow topography, passive microwave imaging, and the three other missions uh, are high resolution land surface temperature, hyperspectral imaging, L band uh, SAR as well, potentially. So we are uh, running some uh, uh, phase A, B1 system studies. And this concludes this presentation. I would like to, to thank you for your attention. This is an animation of the Larsen uh, Sea Ice Shelf uh, break. This was a monster iceberg of 200 kilometers that could be monitored with Sentinel-1. I invite you to go, if you need some technical information on Sentinel, to the second uh, uh, website here, Sentinel Online, where you get a lot of information. There is also a, a Sentinel uh, app, which is available. And um, thank you again. Thank you very much, Pierre and Peter. Uh, so uh, we'll have uh, time now uh, to take a few questions. I'm going to kick things off with a couple of questions myself. Uh, then we'll uh, put it out to all of you to see if you have any questions. We'll get to toss around the microphone cube again. So there is your incentive to have good questions. And if you don't have any, I'll just keep, up, keep making up questions myself. Um, but I uh, wanted to begin, first of all, by thanking you both uh, for the presentation, for taking the time here to meet with us. Um, uh, the first question I wanted to ask, uh, you both uh, pointed uh, out some of the ways in which the uh, US and European space imaging programs are changing and some of the trends, uh, new data coming uh, online and so forth. Uh, what do you think that the user community uh, should be thinking about in order to prepare themselves for the way in which this world is going to be different in five years, say, than it is today? Uh, either of you want to kick us off? <laughs> okay. 
Uh, I'll, I'll talk in reference to the analysis ready data that, uh, that I talked about. Um, so the reality of the analysis ready data, the, the way we're offering it, is it's still something that is packaged as a huge tarball and to be downloaded by the user. And so USGS recognizes that, that that's not an ideal end goal, right? So if, you know, we, we know the way Earth Engine has things set up, you know, it's not really intended for, for users to download from but to stay in the cloud in that free environment to do, to do research and science. And, and that's a much more efficient place to be. So uh, we recognize that. And uh, so, you know, my last slide, I talked about public-private partnering and determining going forward, you know, what are the ideal roles that government should play vis-a-vis uh, -vis what, what industry does. And so we're still working through that. And I think in, certainly within the next five years, we'll have a much more uh, optimal solution. On that. So I think the users, so certainly those using Earth Engine are, are already familiar with that. But our, our you know, traditional Landsat users, I think that, that's that new world that they need to you know, download as the last resort should be the, the new mantra with a lot of our traditional users. Pierre, anything you want to add? Yeah, I fully concur to this, um, to, to, to this um, uh, statement regarding the potential use of uh, ARD data on which uh, Isa is involved as well. Uh, focusing first on the optical uh, imagery with uh, Sentinel-2 in particular, but also for uh, Sentinel-1. We are working on the similar activities with some type of uh, ARD. Beyond that, um, so you have seen the, the new missions that we are launching, the, actually the replenishment also of the constellations. And I think it's important to, um, for uh, users here to, to realize that we are really working on the long term. So um, there, is a, a run, there are large runs of applications in various domains. Uh, all the information is available on the, on the various websites uh, re regarding the Sentinels. And uh, this is um, really, everything is ready to, for the users to look at the, the, the detail of the, the products and the feature and to be prepared in order to exploit at, at the best extent the, uh, this uh, Sentinel data on the long term. Great. Oh, well, let me, uh, before I just use up all of our time with questions of my own, let me quickly see uh, if anybody wants to kick us off with a question from the audience. I'm realizing now that I accidentally agreed to have my attempt at throwing a ball live streamed on the internet. Uh, so that may have been an error. Uh, <laughs> anybody uh, want to challenge my throwing arm? Questions about either of uh, the talks or anything else uh, that might be of interest from our speakers here? All right. I'm gonna do this the uh, underhanded way and hopefully not kill anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm interested to know how you see the future of the decreasing costs of satellite missions and commercial companies jumping in and what used to be, well, only the big governmental institutions doing this. How is this going forward according to you? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go ahead and start with that. So, so that, that's like the the billion dollar question, no pun intended. Uh, so uh, we're looking at that, right? That, that that's, that's question is front and center for us in regards to Landsat 10, right? It's, it's, we're not looking to increase costs. You know, the, the, the current administration has made that very clear that they want future missions to be no, certainly cost no more and ideally less than current missions. And so uh, we're taking that to heart in terms of, again, like I said before, I was speaking in regards to the, to the data management issue, but it also applies for, for new missions. Is there a role? So we're seeing this emergence of, of the small stack community. Is there a role? What, what should be those roles for government and private sector? Um, and so uh, I will point you to a study that was just released by a federal advisory committee that, that does advise the USGS. Um, it, it's called the National Geospatial Advisory Committee, or NGAC and they have a subcommittee called the Landsat Advisory Group. They just published a study in April of this year that looked at various, what I'll call business models for advising the government on, on different approaches to this in terms of how could something be, and this has been attempted in the past, right? Landsat, Landsat missions in the past, uh, the most well-known case was in the 1980s where uh, you know, it, was, it was basically handed to the private sector to pursue, and that was uh, EOSAT. And, and that 
that experiment kind of went down in flames. Uh, now, you know, timing is everything, and this is a new day. So it may be that a, a true public-private partnering, and when I say partnering, I mean the private sector is throwing some skin in the game, right? Not just being asked to, to uh, construct some instrument, but that, that they've got something at risk. And so we're going to be looking at that question again, as we have periodically throughout the Landsat uh, program. And uh, that's a kind of a long-winded answer to your question there, but it, it's an important question. Peter, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, on the other side, we are fully aware of this change of, um, of situation with these um, constellations of hundreds of satellites uh, providing uh, very good data, Earth observation data uh, at global level. Uh, we, so actually, the situation uh, will become a mixture between uh, the type of satellites we have today with the Sentinels, but also this, uh, uh, let's say, this uh, commercial missions. That will have to play uh, that will play a role definitely, uh, with which ISA is, is also trying to set up some uh, cooperation as well. Uh, we have recently in uh, in Europe, for instance, this ice eye uh, mission, uh, which is uh, an initiative in, uh, from uh, from Finland, with which we try to cooperate to to see what can be done together. Um, I must say that uh, in terms of um, um, data quality, in terms of um, uh, performance of the missions. It will be difficult to do without missions of the type of Landsat, or the type of the Sentinels. Uh, if you want to ensure this uh, frequent coverage, global coverage, with um, uh, so large swaths, very good uh, resolution, and also uh, very good revisit frequency. So, and funding is normally there on the European side with the Copernicus program, thanks to the European Union and other member states to really. Uh, look forward the, the future and maintain this type of missions as well in parallel of the commercial initiatives. Other questions in the audience? Yeah. Oh, there's one over here, two over here, if you want to toss the uh, cube in that general direction. Nice. Uh, is it, is it yep. Yes. So the question isn't uh, actually mine. I will read uh, one note of Nature magazine published in 24th of April of this year. I will therefore quote, US government considers charging for popular Earth observing data. Images from Landsat satellites and agriculture survey programs are freely available to scientists, but for how long? That's the question I'm transferring to you. Okay, well, I'm sure you didn't that, see that one coming. That no, I didn't see that coming. So that question wasn't yours, and this an uh, I'll say that this answer isn't mine. <laughs> uh, so yes, that did touch off quite the firestorm. And uh, so that, that group I talked about earlier, the NGAC, the National Geospatial Advisory Committee, uh, another study that we've at, we, the Department of Interior, USGS, did ask them to look at is in regard to, again, under the, under the category of business models. And so, uh, unfortunately, at the time, we kind of titled it this fee recovery plausibility, and that, and that really just touched off this huge whirlwind. But uh, I, I think we need to just calm down about it and take a deep breath, because uh, this, this is not a new thing. Uh, we've, been, we've asked our advisory committee to look at this topic again. In fact, they published a paper in 2012, uh, defending why you know Landsat needed to stay free and open, that was kind of the intent or the conclusion of that paper. So, so this time around, the group is taking what I, what I would consider to be a much more um, in-depth review of the issue. And so, so cost recovery is one of several issues they're going to look at within the context of what makes sense for business models going forward when you have a government role and a commercial role. Because there has to be, at the end of the day, some inducement or some motivation for a private sector company to put some skin in the game. And uh, you know, that's, that's what we re really want to explore. What, what's plausible at the same time you know, keeping, uh, ideally, some level of free and open data? And, and like I said, if you look at that report that I, I said was published in April, they do uh, that report talked about two business models which this new report, the fee recovery report, if you will, is going to kind of expand upon. So uh, you know, the reality is, on the political side of this, you've got a new administration in office, well, relatively new, year and a half, 
uh, with, with you know, their priorities uh, in terms of budget and these kinds of issues. And so oftentimes with a new administration, they have a lot of questions. And so I think, you know, honestly, it's a healthy thing to do. It's a healthy question to ask to determine, you know, so it went free and open in 2008. Well, you know, why were you charging before? And so what are we getting out of free? What are the taxpayers getting out of it? So it's a healthy question to ask, and it does, if nothing else, force us to defend if we're going to stay with the free and open. You know, it forces us to, to make a, uh, you know, put together a strong defense if that's the way this goes. I'm not trying, I, I, the issue with trying to answer this question is whatever I say, it's gonna look like I'm condoning one position or another, and I'm really not. My position in this, with this uh, issue is to try to uh, make the team be objective about looking at the pros and cons of, of you know, the issues. So, uh, you know, we're not gonna be uh, charted for Landsat, you know, tomorrow or any time. I mean, it's an advisory committee. They're gonna advise us. And so, you know, I think, I think I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so the Copernicus program uh, began with a strong free and open data policy. Uh, have you seen these questions come up uh, in the European community? Do, do, do people wonder why or whether that was the right decision or? Well, at the beginning of the, um, the Copernicus program, indeed, when the program was set up, there were a lot of discussions re related to this free and open data policy. Um, for, from some member states, actually, they were a bit reluctant to have this type of um, uh, free and open data policy. But on the other side, we have always tried to, to push for, uh, indeed, uh, making available freely this data from the Sentinels. Um, I think the result is, uh, is very good. The, the, the key objective is uh, really to democratize the, the use of remote sensing data and, um, and uh, this uh, user uptake and uh, users uh, from uh, the Earth engine are clearly a, a great illustration of uh, what does it mean. So there were difficult discussions, uh, but at the end uh, we, we managed to make it through. Uh, and I think it was a very good achievement to ensure this free and open data policy. Other questions in the audience? One right behind you there. Short toss. <laughs> Hello, I'd really like to ask, I'm, I'm curious to know, what is the future of analysis ready data Sentinel-1 uh, from the ESA's perspective? I mean, we do have availability, for example, of you know, optical sensors, ARD data sets. But uh, apart from the Google platform, for example, and some projects like that the Australians have done recently, I mean, we don't really have avail available, like from ISA's website, Sentinel-1 analysis ready data, if I'm correct. So. Thoughts on ARD in the Sentinel-1 world? Yes, we are. It's a bit more complicated. It's not like yeah. the optical data sets, obviously. So we need to consider a lot of different there things. Is, be yeah, there is an initiative uh, in the frame of uh, CEOs. Um, which started actually from the, the optical missions and uh, uh, slowly Sentinel-1 and the radar mission in general are, are joining now. We are uh, indeed trying to, um, to identify at best what would be the, the relevant ARD uh, data for, for users. And uh, we start with, um, for instance, gamma uh, information. Um, but this is still, uh, um, let's say, not mature enough. We are working on that. Actually, it's this forum also is, a, is an excellent um, uh, opportunity to, to get from your side what type of uh, ARD you would like from, uh, from some missions, for instance. Uh, but it's uh, definitely not advanced as for the, the optical missions. Yeah, this is something that uh, we have thought about um, on the Google side, not as formal ARD, but just uh, looking at what uh, derived data products ought we uh, to be making available from Sentinel-1. Part of why I'm so excited about that mission is, as I was alluding earlier, it's the first time that we as a community have gotten to really grapple with what do you want to do when you have a deep time series of uh, you know, systematically acquired uh, synthetic aperture radar data. And uh, as you all help us figure out what you really want, tell us, tell them, uh, and I think the community as a whole uh, can uh, then start to fill that need. Uh, you know, how to really get meaning out of the interferometric data uh, in, without making everyone go back to the raw product every time, uh, for example, is something that we've been thinking about a lot, but we're really not sure what the right uh, answers are. So uh, I will turn that question back to the entire community. Conceptually, you needn't all answer right now. Um, any other questions 
from one in the back. Back-ish, middle bay, yeah, you. <laughs> Hi, I was wondering um, with the future of hyper hyperspectral imaging, um, how far do you think the technology is uh, it for implementation as far as the both collection, transfer, and storage of that data? Yeah, I'm still waiting for my space-borne hyperspectral imager with a systematic data acquisition uh, policy. <laughs> and we'll keep waiting. Uh, either of you uh, have any thoughts on hyperspectral? So, so yes, we do get this a lot, um, and uh, so it's it's still within the uh, within the discussion in regards to Landsat 10, uh, and there's all kinds of themes on what what does hyperspectral mean versus a spectrometer. You know, can it be more selective, and can you just pull down the bands you want? And you know, because of the bandwidth issues, of course, we're, for Landsat 10, we're talking about 10 years from now, right? So, you know, there, there's optical comms and all kinds of things that are going to mature. But uh, uh, hyperspectral today is is viewed more as a, uh, at least from from USGS's perspective, um, a technology demonstration kind of capability from space, right? And so, Landsat has a strong tradition in supporting uh, operational type users. And I think we all know what I mean by operational, right? Users who have a need to satisfy some, or they need, need the data to satisfy some kind of programmatic product that, uh, you know, that, that, they're gonna, that their users use. And so uh, NASA is more about you know, technology demonstration in terms of you know, what, what they will promote. And, and uh, USGS, with regards to Landsat, it's more of the uh, meat and potatoes. You know, it's got to be tried and true technology. And so having said all of that, you know, that, that's kind of how I view it today. But for Landsat 10, that's 10 years out. Uh, this, you know, stuff is, is maturing very rapidly. So uh, I think it's, it's still on the table uh, for Landsat 10 in terms of some kind of, I'll call it, uh, you know, maybe selective hyperspectral, uh, you know, for some happy medium for the bandwidth and, and the ground segment side of the story. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are asking, you know, when are we going to see that? So you know, it, it does get discussed quite a bit. Has Copernicus been looking at the hyperspectral sensor? Yes, actually, it's part of one of the um, candidate missions, so new Sentinels, as I showed uh, just uh, before. Uh, we are starting some um, uh, phase zero, uh, phase A, B uh, system studies regarding this uh, hyperspectral. But like the other missions, nothing is decided yet. It's mainly a matter of uh, funding, which is uh, has to come from ISA member state and also from our partner, uh, our key partner, the European Commission, as part of the next uh, financial perspective of the European Union uh, 21 uh, 27. So it's part of the six possible candidate missions uh, because there are uh, user requirements uh, asking for this type of observations. Uh, but at this stage, I cannot say more actually whether it will materialize or, or not. All right, I think we have time for one more question, and I see a hand up, so I think you are our lucky winner. Can someone get him our cube? Oh, yeah, nice. Thank you. So uh, we've talked a lot about optical and SAR, but uh, there's also some plans for LiDAR missions, uh, and we will be, will be have the same data policies on uh, JEDI and the other planned missions, and we will uh, see them, let's say, Google Earth Engine, having this kind of access to the next... Uh, uh, missions on, on that front of LIDAR. Sure. So first on the on the uh, existence and the data policy, LIDAR missions, where are we where do we stand? So in terms of LIDAR from space, that's not something that uh, at least the program that I'm here representing has uh, spent a lot of time uh, looking at. Um, I, I don't know if Pierre wants to comment a little further. I mean, I really don't have much to add in terms of, you know, policy and where are things going because there is the ADM mission, which is monitoring wind, which is not part of Copernicus. It's a nurse explorer mission of the ISA program, the Earth Observation Envelope program, which is about to be launched. And definitely there, the, the data policy is the same is free open, uh, like the other Earth Explorer missions, um, which are outside the Copernicus framework. So all related data are free and open, uh, accessible to all users. Just, I guess, to close by responding to the part of your question about LiDAR data in Earth Engine, I'll just mention that uh, there's a technical challenge there in that the data is shaped quite differently than uh, map projected uh, you know, uh, um, optical imagery or so forth. And 
so whenever we're looking at bringing a very new type of data into Earth Engine, we're again asking the question, what do people really want to be able to do with this data? What are the right analytical primitives to make available to them and so forth? And, uh, so uh, that would be a good conversation to maybe have with our folks here this week, uh, help us understand uh, how you really want to be able to use LiDAR data. Uh, the derived products that are map projected, that are made with LiDAR data are a different story, but the raw LiDAR data itself is a bit challenging to wedge in right now. Anyway, uh, with that, uh, let's please uh, thank again both of our speakers, uh, Peter and Pierre. Uh, thank you. And uh, that ends our live stream as well. So goodbye, Internet. And uh, somebody should tell me what's next. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>